ओके लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड सो द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट आई वॉन्ट टू मैंशन इज दैट अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल हैव submitted assignments as a set of images well you have to convert it to a pdf form and submit in such a manner that the image is upright okay you can't submit images that are like slanting or something and submit that as a bunch of images as homework i mean that's really very irresponsible of you if you are doing it uh you know the grader is not supposed to unzip your file and put all the images in the right set right sequence right order and then grade it and then give you comments i mean that's very very irresponsible behavior and you shouldn't do it the second thing is do not submit a zip file if you have made errors if 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 you submit as a m file the grader can go through it within that uh, within the space and they, then he can point out where the mistake is if you submit it as a zip file then the grader has to download it and then he has to go through the code and uh, try to give you feedback on your code so that's really again not a good good habit uh, the third thing is make sure all your functions are within the same m file you can't submit a part of your m file and then leave out the rest of the function that are called within that m file because a lot of people have done that and you have received less marks than what you deserved because you haven't uploaded the complete code so the grader cannot run it at his end so please don't do that as well i mean it's a uh, Uh, these are some things that you should you should already be uh, you know thinking about how much time or effort the grader has to give on to each of these assignments and if you do things like these it really becomes very difficult for the grader to go through individual codes and troubleshoot it because it's not running for whatever reason it's not running um so that's the important thing so in the next assignment onward which is assignment 3 onward If your submission is not up to the mark if it becomes very difficult to grade you get straight off minus 10 points. Okay so make sure you submit a PDF make sure your codes are well written well and all the codes are within a same m file so the grader doesn't have to look for other helping files here and there in order for him to be able to run your code. So should we just submit one that m file for the whole No 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 so problem 2b you should have one m file okay. So what some people have done is for problem 2b they have written three or four different functions and then they are calling all the functions in one master file and then they have uploaded only the master files and not the other four functions that they were calling in the master file. So in MATLAB you can write all the functions within the same m file and you can write a function that I mean you can write the code such that all the functions are defined within the same m file you don't have to call something from outside like a different function or something. So don't do that. I mean, it's not a good practice. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, like assignment two, uh, problem four B. Uh huh. In order to uh, operate the uh, the code, you need the value of Q matrix. Right. Which is you get from problem A. Correct. So should I do it again in this in the uh, M file? I mean, you can just submit problem four. You can just submit one M file for entire problem four if you think that makes more sense. That's fine. A long code is better than graded downloading five different codes and running it on a single machine. Confusing which one is A, which one is B. It's not. You can always write comments in your M file. You know there is this percent sign, and then with percent size you can write the comment solving problem A, solving problem B, solving problem C and D, and so on. Okay. So that's what it means for you to have a well documented code. Okay. So you write what exactly are you doing within each section. so that the grader doesn't have to apply his own mind to figure out oh you might be using a mio rule or you might be using some other step size or whatever you are doing in your particular code okay so that's that's the important thing no zip files and submission should be a pdf file okay you cannot submit images as your assignment it has to be a pdf file sorry No, not for assignment two, but assignment three onwards, you will lose points if you submit a zip file. Okay, and for the project, uh, you know, many of the jobs that you will find these days, you know, the job postings, it will always say you should have good communication skills. So use the project as a way to improve your technical writing skills. Okay, and there are two books that I found really good. to help me improve my technical writing when i was a graduate student one of them is keys to great writing it's a book for journalists 
but the ideas are applicable in any areas of science and engineering or journalism or whatever okay uh, there is another good book uh, by 50 strategies for a successful writer it's also very good you should use i mean if you think that your writing is not up to mark you definitely should use these books to improve your writing skills it's very very important to know how to write well and i will definitely give you feedback on the project reports that you will submit about whether you are writing doing a good job of communicating the ideas effectively or not okay so don't take it in the negative light you should always try to improve your skills and maybe look at some of these books to improve your writing communication and so on it's really very important uh, in in order to grow in your career oh and that reminds me the executive summary should comprise of what's the problem that you are targeting what have you already done what do you plan on doing in the future okay those are the three three paragraphs it should span one page and that's all you have to do what is the problem what have you done what do you plan on doing in the future okay so for instance the problem is optimizing something optimizing the a sensor network i don't know what that problem even means okay optimizing a sensor network i have looked at paper 1 it has blah 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 algorithm in the future i'm going to look at paper 2 and 3 and study the algorithms and compare the two the algorithm with the algorithm that i've just studied okay that's a possible executive summary but not so short okay it has to be a slightly longer than what i said okay what is the problem what have you done what do you plan on doing in the project okay maybe some of you have already done the project is there anyone in the class who's already done the project like written the eight page report as draft no one okay <laughs> <laughs> all right okay uh okay so i want to continue our discussion about linear programming with barrier method so let me check if the video is working okay seems like seems like everything is working so if you recall our problem is to minimize c transpose x such that a x equal to b x greater than equal to 0 and we are using the barrier method so we come up with a function we define a set s which is uh, x in r n such that a x equal to b x strictly greater than 0 and what else oh we define a function f epsilon of x as c transpose x minus summation i equals 1 to n log of xi and then i define x star of epsilon as argument of f epsilon for x in s sorry should there be an epsilon in that equation oh yes absolutely and remember the idea in barrier method was that we find x star epsilon so at every stage we start with uh, x star x star epsilon k minus 
and then we find x star epsilon k and then reduce the value of epsilon k and try to solve the problem again. Okay? So that was the basic idea in barrier method. So for this particular method, we are going to do the same thing, but there are two questions that needs to be answered. The first is how to get x epsilon k from x epsilon k minus 1, or in other words, well, x star. Okay, we need to solve the problem exactly. So in barrier method, you need to solve this problem exactly. But now, we will start with an approximation of x star epsilon k minus 1, and we will try to get to x star, no, to an approximation of x star epsilon k. Okay, so uh, in this method, the question is how to go from x star x epsilon k minus 1, which is an approximation of x star epsilon k minus 1 to x epsilon k, which is an approximation of x star epsilon k. Okay, and the second question is how to change, how to get epsilon k from epsilon k minus 1. Okay, those are the two questions that we need to answer. Any questions so far? Question? No? What do you mean? Well, that's for a general problem. This is a very specific algorithm. Okay? Uh, so this algorithm was developed in 1980, 1980s. Okay? I think 84 when the paper was published, 83 or 84. So somewhere in 1980s, this algorithm that I'm going to present on the board was published. Okay? And let's uh, look at it in terms of a diagram. What exactly are we doing? This would be, so this is my set. Ax equal to b, x greater than or equal to 0. Let's say this is my x star, which is which solves this particular problem. And this is my x star infinity, where epsilon is taken to be infinity. So epsilon equals to infinity. And this is my central path. This is the same as x star equals to x star 0. Okay, so when epsilon is equal to 0, you are essentially trying to solve uh, this problem. When, when, ep, when epsilon is equal to 0, all you are doing is minimizing C transpose x over the set. Okay, so x star, which is the optimal solution to the original problem, is the same as x star of 0, which is the optimal solution when epsilon is taken equal to 0. Okay, and so our goal today is to to not be, so in barrier method, what I had said in the previous class is that you have to trace this path exactly. But what we are going to, to, do, to do today is different. We are not going to trace this path exactly, but we are going to trace a neighborhood of this particular path, and we will still reach the same x star. Okay? So, so the, the key idea is, follow the central path approximately. That's the idea that we will follow today. Okay. So how should we uh, go about doing it? So let's say I started from a point, so let's look at just the first iteration. Okay, all I want to do is just be able to solve the first iteration. 
So I started with the point X, which is in S. What does it mean? X is strictly positive and AX is equal to B. Okay, so somehow somebody gave you this point X and you can verify it that it is in the set X itself, S itself. And then you want to derive X tilde, which is X plus alpha X bar minus X, right? Where X bar comes from solving this problem, argument Z such that AZ is equal to B. Okay, and we will pick a value of alpha through our Miho rule or through some such method. Uh, we'll get to it towards the end. Okay, how to pick a value of appropriate value of alpha. But everyone remembers what this method is. This method we had covered this method. I forgot the name, but I think it's uh, it's conditional gradient. No, it's not conditional gradient. Which method is this? gradient projection right this is the gradient projection method for solving an optimization problem over az equal to b space is it gradient projection yeah i think it is gradient projection so what is the derivative of F epsilon at X. C1 minus 1 over X1. Cn minus 1 over Xn. Right? What is my second derivative of F epsilon at X? Remember, I can, I can take the inverse of X1 because I know that X1 and x2 and x3, all of them are strictly positive, right? So inverse is well defined because each of these values are greater than zero. What is the second derivative of f epsilon x? That's one over x1 square, one over xn square, zero, zero. So I'm going to write it as x raised to minus two. Oh, there is an epsilon term. Epsilon. Okay, don't forget the epsilon term. Okay, so it turns out that of course, uh, given that, I mean, X is already chosen, so all of this is a quadratic programming problem. And all we have to do is uh, solve this particular problem. So we can do that, okay? We can do that using uh, the same result that we had used earlier. So let's see what that result was. So we had used, remember, when did we solve this problem? We solved it for the affine scaling, right? Affine scaling method for linear programming. So we solved a similar problem at that point, and we have to solve the same problem. So I'll just give you what the solution is. So your x bar is given by x minus capital X Q 
x epsilon and q x epsilon is given by x c minus a transpose lambda over epsilon minus 1 and then I have lambda which is given by a x square a transpose inverse a x x c minus epsilon Okay, so this is this is correct. I haven't made any mistakes here. Okay, so this is the this is the solution. This is the solution to this particular optimization problem. Okay. I'm going to rewrite this as follows. My Q of x comma epsilon can be given as x inverse x bar minus x okay so that's by manipulating this particular equation now sorry no uh, oh oh i see so there is a mistake in the book Is that correct? Okay, good. So now I have to tell the author uh, that there is a mistake at this point in your book. Okay, so this is this is indeed true. Okay, but uh, but let's look at let's look at it in the in the diagram here, or, or let me make zoom in. So this is my central path. This is my x, and where should my x bar be? Where should my x bar be? X bar will be somewhere closer to the central path, right? The reason is, this will be my x bar. The reason is, this is a Newton iteration, right? This is a Newton's iteration. It's going to converge to the central line very fast. So my x bar has to be close to the central path. And if I compute the x the next x bar, which is x double bar, let's say, it will be much closer to this central path, right? Because it's going to converge in a super linear fashion to the central path, which is where the optimal value lies. So this one is my x star epsilon. So what I can do is think of this as a way to measure how close my point x is with respect to the central line okay so what i'm saying is what i'm saying is q of x epsilon is 
measure of proximity of x with respect to the central path. x star epsilon. Is that clear? So, since x, since x bar is very close to x star epsilon because we are taking a Newton, Newton's method, right? So, since x is very close to, so x bar is very close to x star epsilon, I can think of q of x comma epsilon which is in terms of x minus x bar, I can think of it as a way to measure the proximity of x with respect to the central line. So, if q of x epsilon is small, then x is very close to the central path. If q of x epsilon is large, then x is very far away from the central path. So, in particular, a fact that is easy to check is q of x epsilon is equal to 0 if and only if x equals to x star epsilon. Okay. Any questions so far? Sorry? Well, you mean how do I get this expression? Uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. One of them is the easiest method that I know of is through Lagrange multiplier. But we haven't yet studied. Lambda here is the same as Lagrange multiplier corresponding to AX equal, AZ equals to B constraint. Okay. So, so yeah. But uh, you, can, you can come up with the same result if you use the KKT conditions. This is a convex problem, so you can use KKD conditions to derive the same result. Okay. Any other question? No? Okay. So, hopefully by now you are convinced that what we have to figure out or what we have to keep track of is Q of X comma Epsilon. So, we will use this idea, the fact that the closer Q of X Epsilon is with respect to 0, the closer x is with respect to x star epsilon and it's now time to reduce the value of epsilon okay so the first proposition along this line is x is in s q of x comma epsilon is less than 1 this implies that x bar is in s and Q of x bar comma epsilon is less than equal to this is proposition one. Okay, so there are there is really two parts of this result. First of all, if you remember, we hadn't imposed this constraint that z has to be strictly positive. In our, in our optimization problem for x bar. Okay, I don't have the problem here, so I can't show it to you. But remember, x bar was argument over z such that az is equal to b of some optimization problem, right? So z greater than 0 was not imposed as a condition here, but it so turns out that x bar that you obtain will also lie in S, which means X bar will have strictly positive entries. Okay, that's a conclusion of this particular result. So, if X is in S, so if X is in S, okay, away from boundary, so X is here, if I compute X bar and assuming that X is close to uh, the central path, then X bar 
will be much, much closer to the central path and you can exactly quantify it using this relationship. And moreover, x bar will also be in S. Okay, so x bar will also be away from the boundary. It will be closer to the central path. Okay, so that's the two parts of this result. Uh, we'll not prove it because the proof is somewhat involved, uh, but it can be done. Okay, all you have to do is go through a set of series of inequalities and prove that each inequalities hold true, and then you will you will be able to prove this result. Uh, the proof is given in the book. Okay, so the upshot is. bar is very is close to the x star epsilon okay so now that we have done so now that we have gotten close to the central path it's now time to change epsilon okay and so we need another result which tells us how should we change the value of epsilon in the next iteration. So let's uh, look at what the second result is. Okay. So now we will address the second question, which is how to get epsilon k from epsilon k minus 1. Okay. Now that we have gotten close to the central path, now we need to change the value of epsilon. So how should we do it? So here is the next proposition, which says the following. If x is in S, Q of x comma epsilon is less than equal to gamma strictly less than 1, then for all delta in 0 square root n, delta less than equal to gamma 1 minus gamma over 1 plus gamma. define epsilon bar equals to 1 minus delta over square root of n epsilon implies q of x bar epsilon bar is going to be less than equal to gamma. Okay, so let's look at, we'll look at the picture in a bit. I'll let you guys write it down. Okay, so what is, what is happening here? So I start from this. Let's say I have this set, okay, and this is my central path. I started from x at a very at a particular value of epsilon. I came at x bar, okay, and this is let's say my x star of epsilon. So I started from x. I did one Newton step. I took one Newton step, okay, not more, only one Newton step. I reached this point, which is close to x star epsilon. And then what I'm doing is based on, based on some parameter, I'm changing the value of epsilon bar. Okay, I'm changing the value of epsilon. I'm reducing it. Remember, this is 
a number that is strictly less than one. So I'm reducing the value of epsilon. Okay, so I reduce the value of epsilon. So this is my x star epsilon bar. Okay, and starting from this point, I compute the next Newton iterate. Let me call it x double bar. So I came from this point to this point. From this point, I will arrive at this point, which is the first Newton iterate, starting with x bar, and with the value of epsilon to the value of epsilon will be changed to epsilon bar, which is strictly less than epsilon. Okay, and what the result says? Remember, what is q? X bar epsilon bar. This is proximity. of x double bar from x star epsilon bar. Okay, that's what this means, right? Oh, proximity of x with respect to the central path. So this will be proximity of x bar from x star epsilon bar. Okay, so it turns out that x bar will also be close to x star epsilon bar. So this x bar will be close to x star epsilon bar. And when I get x double bar from this expression, from this expression, we know that it will be much closer to x star epsilon bar than x bar was. Okay, so this distance will be larger than this distance. Okay, that's what this proposition one is saying. So what we do, the, the way the algorithm will work is we start with some arbitrary point x, we get closer to the central path, I mean we pick a value of epsilon naught, we start with some arbitrary value x, we run multiple Newton's iteration to get closer to the central path in the first step, okay? And then all we have to do is, I mean all we have to make sure is that q of x comma epsilon is strictly less than one, q of x comma epsilon is strictly less than one. Then I can change the value of epsilon in this fashion. And I just have to take one Newton iterate, okay? And I will be much closer to x, x star epsilon bar. Then I will change the value of epsilon with this fashion. And then I will be epsilon double bar, and starting from this point, I will run one Newton iteration, and I will reach this point, which is x triple bar, okay, and so on. And we will keep using proposition one and two in tandem, so proposition, proposition two, then proposition one, then proposition two, so proposition one. We'll keep doing this until we reach the optimal point, which is here, x star zero. Okay, is that, is that clear? Any question? This one? No, oh, was it the right hand side? Yeah, it was the right hand side, yeah. Okay, so this, this is something which is less than one. So the square of it is much closer to zero. It's much, much less than one. And so q x bar epsilon will be very small, which means x bar is very close to x star epsilon. Okay, so is it clear how we are approximately following the central path? If you look at it, We go from x to x bar, which is closer to central path. Then we run one Newton iteration, we get to x double bar. We reduce the value of epsilon to epsilon double bar. Then we run one Newton iteration, we reach this point. Then we again change the value of epsilon, and then we run one Newton iteration, and so on. So the attractive property here is all you have to do is one Newton iteration at every point of time. Okay, you don't have to do two, you don't have to do three, you don't have to do... 10, 20, 30 Newton iteration. All you have to do is one Newton iteration and you know for sure because of these two proposition that you are very close to the central path. So you are essentially tracking the central path very closely 
and you essentially, and you will end up being at the optimal point because of the way barrier method works. Okay? So that's, uh, this algorithm was designed, it has very good theoretical properties uh, in the worst case. So if I give you the worst instance of linear programming to solve, this algorithm will be the fastest algorithm to give you the optimal solution. Okay? It works pretty fast. But here is the catch. Okay? The catch is, it works well for the worst linear programming problem, but for the general linear programming problem, it doesn't work that well. Okay? So it is the best algorithm to solve the worst problem, but not the best algorithm to solve an average problem. Now, the second thing I want to note is this delta, right? You, you see delta is divided by square root of n. Gamma is strictly less than 1. So gamma multiplied by 1 minus gamma is a small number. So delta is a small number. If delta is small, then epsilon bar is close to epsilon, right? So the reduction in epsilon bar is not much at every point of time. So, so then you have to take a large number of iterations in order to reach the optimal point. So one way you can speed up the algorithm without actually proving that it's going to converge, but one way to speed up the algorithm is to reduce epsilon at a much faster rate. Okay, so 0 0.5 multiplied by, so epsilon k plus 1 equals 0 0.5 multiplied by epsilon k. But then what is the problem? The problem is within one iteration, you can't reach closer to the central path. So you might have to take multiple Newton iteration in order to get closer to the central path. Okay, so there is a trade-off. So the trade-off is as follows. Epsilon k goes to zero slowly and use one Newton iteration. This is option number one. Option number two is epsilon k goes to zero fast or quickly. and use multiple Newton's iteration. Okay, so these are the two, two possible options you can choose if you were implementing this particular algorithm. So what's happening in number two? What's happening in number two? This is my central path. I start from x. This is my x star epsilon. I do, let's say, two Newton step. I get to this x bar. And then I change the value of epsilon by a huge margin. So this is x of x star of 0 0.5 or 0 0.3 epsilon. So now this point is quite far from x star 0 0.3 epsilon. So I have to take multiple Newton step to reach closer to this central path and then I'm going to change it to x star 0 0.09 epsilon and then again I have to do multiple Newton step to reach this point. So contrast this method with this method where you have to take only one Newton step and change the value of epsilon. Okay, so this is algorithm number one, and this is algorithm number two. Algorithm number two works well in practice. Algorithm one, number one works well in theory. Okay. 
Sorry? Uh, I didn't get your question. This is the central path. So yeah, how do you know I see. So you're saying how do you visualize the central path in higher dimension? Well, uh, remember what was x star of epsilon. So. Right, this was my x star of epsilon. And I know that f of 0 of x is equal to c transpose x. Right, so when epsilon is taken to be equal to 0, then what you have is the original problem. So you know that a central path like this exists. Okay, there is no, there is no doubt about that. There is no question about that. That's always going to be there. Uh, the only thing is how do you trace? You have to be get closer to the central path and then trace it. So you don't really know where the central path is. I mean, MATLAB, when you put this function in the MATLAB, MATLAB doesn't know where the central path is. So if you're just getting close to the central path every time, as you get closer to the optimal solution, do you ever actually reach the optimal solution or you just get close to it? You just get close to it in this case. Because the barrier will always prevent it from, from getting at the optimal solution because the function is infinity. Right, so, uh, but for most problem, it's fine if you're close to the optimal solution. You have a tolerance level and you're fine as long as you're within that tolerance level. Okay, any other question? How do you pick the initial value of epsilon? How do you? Pick the initial value of epsilon. Oh, that is arbitrary. Anything, 10, 15, whatever you want. Yeah, there is no, there is no guidance about what you should do, what you should pick as initial x naught and initial epsilon naught. Okay, so for that you will have to probably solve. Uh, you'll have to use your intuition about the problem, or be a bit clever about how you formulate the problem in order to get a feasible x x naught, uh, so that you can start from the set itself, or you can use projection theorem to project a point onto the set, and then use that point as an initial condition. Okay, it's all a linear linear uh, set, so there is no problem with that. Okay. Linear manifold, yeah. If you do a projection, will that put it on the barrier of this set? Well, so you are not, you're in, initially you are only finding x naught, okay? okay? All you want to find is a point in the set itself. You don't care what the barrier is or where the barrier is, right? So let's say, let's say this was your initial set, right? You started from a point here, then you project it onto this set, you reach here, then you try to move in some direction within the set itself, so you are always strictly positive. So all your entries are strictly positive. Okay, so you, it might require some amount of trial and error, some amount of random, uh, using random numbers to figure out where exactly you should go. Right, but it, it's not very difficult problem to find a point within the set itself. In fact, for the manifold suboptimization, I've given you what the initial point should be. Right? If you if you have attempted that problem, which I hope some of you have, but if you have attempted the manifold suboptimization problem, I've explicitly given you what your initial point should be, so that you are within the set itself, within the set of feasible points. Okay. Any other question? No? So, if you are a PhD student, you should go with number one, algorithm number one, because you can prove nice things about it. This is the best algorithm for the worst possible linear, pro linear program that you can get. But if you are a practitioner, if you are a master student, if you want to go to industry, this is the algorithm you should love, okay? Because it's a hack. You can't prove that it works, but it works. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, it's not like you can't prove that it works, but it's not as elegant as number one. I mean, you can't prove the complexity bound using number two, okay? So complexity bound is hard to get. But for this one, it's much easier to get because you're doing only one Newton iteration at every point of time. 
right? In this case, you don't know how many Newton steps you have to take, so you can't find out the complexity bound for, for the second problem. Okay. Now I want to tell you how this, this algorithm is different from a fine scaling, uh, which we have which we have done earlier. And in a fine scaling, there was no central path. Okay, we were just moving in the set randomly. So in a fine scaling, my x bar was argument of a z equals to b, c transpose z minus x plus 1 over 2 s k z minus x transpose x minus 2 z minus x. Okay, so this was the affine scaling. And in this, in the barrier method, which is also known as interior point method, uh, your x bar is argmin a z equals to b c transpose minus epsilon 1 over x1, 1 over xn, or rather Okay, so these are this. So this is the fine scaling. This is barrier method. Okay, the only difference here is the C term is slightly different in the barrier method. Okay, this is a fine scaling. So here you have C transpose. In barrier method, you have C minus epsilon multiplied by some vector, which includes inverse of the elements of X itself. Okay, this is epsilon x raised to minus two. Here it's one over s k x raised to minus two. Okay, so the there is a very slight difference in the two algorithms, but as you can see, we can prove that this is the best algorithm in the worst case to use. Whereas for a, a fine scaling, we don't have such results. All we can say is in practice it works better than this method. Okay? But we don't have a formal proof that says that affine scaling is better than the barrier method or something of that sort. Okay? So this was, I mean there are multiple variants of this algorithm now which makes it much more faster. There are implementations that are faster than other implementations. But all in all, this method, the number one method here, has the best theoretical properties. Number two method seems to work well in practice. And then, of course, there are cases where simplex method works better than both these methods. So that's all I have for today. And in the next class, uh, we'll talk about other uh, penalty methods for solving constrained optimization problems.